Happy Sunday, Hope City Church Online. I am excited about what God is about to speak to us and through us from his word today. If you don't already have your notebooks or some paper to write down a few things, or maybe open up the app right now and use the fill in the blanks alongside of this. If you're watching on your laptop, maybe grab your phone or maybe you're watching on on the app on your Apple TV or your Roku, grab your phone and follow along and fill in the blanks. It'll be an awesome, awesome opportunity for you to start getting in the habit of taking notes if you aren't already. We are in the fourth and final Final week of our series, Difference Maker, and we're talking about what a difference in our lives it makes to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not just the Holy Spirit adjacent to us, but dwelling in us, flowing through us, and that His presence, His power, that the gifts that He gives us, that they're all this huge difference maker. But what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now, we know a lot about water baptism. We talk about water baptism a lot. It is about water baptism. Some of you were baptized as children. Some of you were baptized as adults. Some of you have been baptized multiple times. You know, and we're not going to get too much into water baptism today, but there is this shared language of baptism that is used when we talk about to being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, the filling of the Holy Spirit or the refilling or the overflowing, which would probably be the most accurate words to use, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's often substituted for the word, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, just so you have a clear understanding, when you made a decision to become a Christ follower, some of you prayed a prayer, some of you were in a church service with me and I said, repeat after me. Some of you were online, just like we are right now. And I asked you to agree with me in prayer and click a box or click a link so that you could get more information about what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. When you became a follower of Jesus, when you began to yield your life to the process of him moving in you, working in you, shifting, changing who you are, you invited the fullness of the Spirit of God to dwell in you. So you are full of the Spirit at con- what we would call conversion, the time that you converted from your life of sin to your life of following Jesus. Now, those are theological terms that we don't really use in regular everyday life, but just so you understand, our belief at Hope City Church with regards to the things of the Holy Spirit is that you are filled with the Spirit at conversion. But there is this secondary baptism of the Holy Spirit, this secondary overflowing, and then subsequent refillings or refuelings, if you will, when it comes to his presence and his power in our lives. And so I want to look at that, but I want to look at it through the lens of the first time that the people have gone them, but the Holy Spirit began to take up residence in them as promised in, by the prophet Joel and as promised by Jesus to his disciples. Now, Jesus told the disciples that they needed to gather together to be prayerful and wait, and that he would send the Holy Spirit, right? He would send Ruha, Numa, the breath of God, and that that God would fill them with his presence, not just be with them, but dwell in them, and that he would give them power, dudamus, dynamite authority here on earth, and that he would gift them with supernatural abilities, that they could do amazing works of miracles, that they could prosper prophesy that they would have life-changing tools to be the voice of God for generations to come. And so we find ourselves back in Acts chapter 2, when the first time ever that the church stopped being just a building people attended, and the church started being the place inside of us where God dwells. We say that all the time at Hope City Church. In fact, About four weeks ago, I preached an entire message on this idea. We don't just go to church, we are the church. And it's because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So everywhere we go is sacred. There is no longer a divide between the two. And so as we find ourselves back at this verse again, Acts chapter two, verse one through four, I wanna sort of take a different angle at it today and hopefully help you to understand probably the most misinterpreted, misunderstood 
awkwardly preached topic, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does it look like? What is it for? Why does it exist? And why so much emphasis is given to the baptism of the Holy Spirit by certain church people, by certain types of pastors? Let's look at it together. Um, Verse one of Acts chapter two, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house that they were sitting in. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, wherever you are right now, say it out loud, say that word, filled, and type it in the chat right now, type in the chat, filled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter two, verse four, it says, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so what is often confused for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply the act of, the, of using the gift of tongues. Now, in ancient times, when the Holy Spirit showed up, as promised, when the comforter, the parakletos, right? When the, when the comforter showed up, the advocate showed up, as promised by Jesus, when that happened, they received power, that deutimous power, that amazing breath of God, that wind of God that blew through that building. And it says that like tongues of fire, like flames, glow, they were glowing on top of their heads. So there's this powerful, dynamic moment that happens. And it says they all began to speak in other tongues. Now, if you keep reading in Acts chapter 2, um, you keep reading 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You see that as the service continues for a couple hours and they stumble out into the streets, it's still early in the morning morning. Everybody goes, look at all these people. Aren't these the followers of Jesus? They look like they're drunk. They don't make any sense. And Peter stands up and says, they're not drunk as you would suppose, but this is what was spoken about by the prophet Joel. And so he starts to unpack what they're doing. And then people are like, how can this be? They're Hebrew. Are they not? Yet they're speaking my native tongue, these people from foreign lands. And so the first time that people spoke and it was their tongues, they were actually languages that other people spoke, and it was a way for the gospel to start to spread all over the place in that moment. Now, what we get confused with the baptism of the Holy Spirit far too often with the overflowing of the Holy Spirit or the filling or the refueling of the Holy Spirit is that we think tongues is that, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. But if you go to the phrase baptism, if you go to that idea in verse four when it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you look at that original word, you see that it means this idea of being cleansed by the dipping or the submerging, to wash, to soak, to make clean with water, to overwhelm, to overflow. So this same phrase in ancient Greek would have been used to obviously talk about the ritual washing um, that we often refer to, because we transliterated it from Greek to English, to baptism. Um, Many of you have been baptized. Sometimes you're in a backyard pool. Sometimes you're at the bay. Sometimes you're in the ocean. You've been baptized before. Some of you were baptized very young, and so maybe you were in a more liturgical church and they sprinkled you. We like to think that the most accurate way to be baptized is the full submersion method. Um, And the reason for that is, is what we're looking at, what the word says, and then the model of Jesus when he was baptized in water. But since today isn't about water baptism, but that shared language of baptism, let's look a little closer at what this word could actually mean. This is the same word that someone perhaps would have used if they were, if their job was to dye fabric. If they were going to take wool and they were going to dye it a different color, they would have to submerse it, dunk it, sink it down in. And then the color that they were sinking the wool into would take over the natural color of the wool and the wool would be changed. It's the same word that we would use um, if we were talking about the process of pickling a vegetable or even sometimes the curing of meats. You would take the cucumber and you would put it in a brine of salt water and spices and then the salt water and the spices that are outside of the cucumber are now in the cucumber. But they're not just on it, they're in it. And so the cucumber takes on a new form, it takes on a new shape, it takes on a new ability. Does that make sense? And so the reason that tongues is often confused as the baptism itself is because 
If you read scripture, the normative expression, the normative outward expression that someone has yielded to the overflowing presence of the Holy Spirit, or as we often call it, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Remember, you're filled with the Spirit at your conversion. I'm a cucumber in the brine to I am a pickle. Are you with me? It's that change agency that's happening in your life because you've yielded and you've been keeping in step and you've been walking in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so the reason that it gets confused is because people have a fear of things they don't understand. And because if you look at scripture and every time someone is recorded as receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the majority of the time that that's recorded, it's followed by or accompanied with speaking in tongues. And so that's why people say things like the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, which is very highbrow theological speak for. It's normal when someone yields fully to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit for that experience to be accompanied by the gift of tongues being present in their life. It happened the first time. It happened subsequently throughout the Bible, Bible history and it's in church history backs it up as well. Now, is it the only way possible? Is it the only thing that could happen? We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but let's dive into this idea of what we even know about the gift of tongues. Like what are tongues and what is the gift of tongues? And so let's do some some digging. Let's do a little bit of research on this together. Um, and, and if you want to take notes and come back to this later, I would encourage you to do that as you're in your life group discussions and other places and spaces. Um, Hope City Church is, is a place where skeptics, doubters, and challengers can come and feel safe and, and comfortable. And so we don't even have to see all of this the same way, eye to eye, to have a discussion about it. We can even agree to disagree because the gift of tongues doesn't make or break salvation. Jesus already paid for that on the cross. And so as we look at it together, let's start with Corinthians chapter 14. In a tongue, two or more at, or three at most should speak. And so what Paul's talking to is the church at Corinth. Remember, Corinth is famous for getting a little bit unruly and not following the rules and getting a little crazy. And so Paul is often sending letters, communications to the church at Corinth, telling them how to behave better when they're in church. And so he says, if someone in a church service, this is the context, is to speak in tongues publicly out loud. So when someone speaks in tongues publicly, that it should be accompanied by interpretation. Where we get this concept of the gift of tongues used for the edification of the church followed with the interpretation is this, right? He says, if one or two people at most three should speak in tongues during a church service, meaning giving the gift of tongues. And then he says, at that time, someone must interpret. If there is no interpret, interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28. Now, it's nuanced, but in there you have two expressions of the gift of tongues. There is your heavenly prayer language, like when we don't know what we ought to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes with us with groans that words cannot express, your heavenly prayer language. And then you have the gift of tongues where you were to, to use that same gift, but using it in such a way that it captures the attention of the rest of the body so that God could speak an interpretive prophecy to the body in that moment. Now, the church at Corinth, they were going crazy, man. People were hopping up. This was new to them. They were so excited about the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues. And so people were jumping up and interrupting services and the worship set would just go on and on and on as people were interrupting and, and there was this unruliness that was happening. And so what's, what he's giving them is this sort of rules for operating the gifts with caution, operating the gifts with, you know, a sense of um, decorum and appropriateness. Now we've swung the pendulum in American church far the other way. And so there's a little bit of shame on us in that. But then at the same time, we, because there's been so much abuse of the gifts, we don't even know how to properly use the gifts. And so as your pastor, I'm going to kind of take us on a journey um, over the course of the next months and years to what that could look like for us. Number two, what are speaking tongues really all about? Speaking in tongues requires some sense of social awareness. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who don't understand, some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Now, many times theologians, scholars, pastors, teachers, well-meaning Christians, they'll take 1 Corinthians 14, 23, and then Acts 2, and they'll fight with each other about them. Because in Acts 2, God uses the ancient church as the Holy Spirit comes upon them to speak in tongues, and then the gospel is spread throughout the world. What's happening in this moment is He's not talking about the gift of tongues to spread the gospel. He's talking about prayer language. And so if you're in a service together and everybody's just wiling out and there's a bunch of people that have no idea what is happening, then you should dial it back a notch. Let me give you an example of this. I was in a prayer meeting that took place in the back room of a Coco's Cafe in La Mesa, California, before that cocoa shut down, um, a bunch of amazing men and women of God that came together for this breakfast and prayer meeting. And we found out that the waitress that had been serving us um, was, was going to be leaving um, the company that she was working for, Coco's, and go working somewhere else. And so we decided that it would be nice if we blessed, did, like prayed a blessing over her before she left. And this particular group of spirit leaders uh, were very comfortable in the expressions of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They would refer to themselves as very Pentecostal. And so we pray for this lady and, you know, a bunch of us stood up. We kind of gathered around her, which is already uncomfortable and ominous. And so as we gather around her, begin to pray for her, the room erupts with everyone praying in their heavenly language, in their in their prayers of tongues and her eyes, everybody's heads are bowed, everybody's eyes are closed and people are, are praying and it's just a roar of nonsense. Uh, it doesn't make sense to her. It, it sounds like everybody's speaking a different language, which for all intents and purposes, they are. And she opens her eyes and I opened my eyes at the same time because I wanted to see if she was okay. And she looked at me and she was like, what is happening? And so they pray, they say, amen, everybody leaves. And so I stayed behind and I had to explain to her what was going on. You see, sometimes we're so excited about using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that using them in such a way that isn't even wise, that operating in the supernatural in such a way that people aren't prepared for. And it's the same way that if you pick fruit off of a tree before it's ripe, the, tr the fruit is going to be bitter. And so when, when Paul's writing to the church in, in Corinth and he's saying, like, if the church is full of people who don't, so now Jesus, you need to tone it down a notch. So now I told you I wanted to be the kind of place and the kind of space where we were more open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and our everyday walking around boarding and sleeping life. But I have to juxtapose verse 2 uh, at sometimes, most of the time, in fact, almost all the time, in our main worship gatherings, there are equal parts Christ followers and non-Christ followers. In fact, if you split the room into thirds, it's probably people who are madly in love with Jesus, people who are struggling in their relationship with Jesus, and people who are there to find out if they want a relationship with Jesus. And so the reason that we don't go off the deep end with the expressions of the Holy Spirit, I like to call it that, I like to call it the expressions of the Holy Spirit when we talk about tongues, is because we have a, an awareness of who is with us. But that's why when you're in a life group scenario or a worship night or in your personal prayer time or two or three, you're gathered together, um, that's why it's okay for you to express your worship in your heavenly language to call out to God and, and powerful prayer on behalf of another by speaking in tongues. Number three, so what do we know about tongues? Speaking in tongues strengthens the person that's speaking, but 
prophecy itself strengthens the whole church. Now, again, I don't know why God chose to do it this way. I talked a little bit about it a couple of weeks ago. We seem to get really enamored and caught up with this idea of tongues. Um, And in reality, and, and I'll go into this in just a moment, in reality, tongues is really one of many gifts of the Holy Spirit, but yet we seem to, as Pentecostal people um, that have agreed that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, flows through us, that we don't go to church, we are the church, we tend to get really enamored by this idea of tongues. Probably because it's the, it's the I don't even know if I'm allowed to say it like this, it's the weirdest, it's the least understood, it's... It seems to be the most complex as Pentecostal charismatics, widely used amongst people who refer to themselves as Pentecostal charismatic or spirit-filled. So if you read, if you keep reading verse 14, chapter 14, verses four and five, it says, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues, Paul says. But even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying so the whole church will be strengthened. And so what he's saying is is that there's a smaller swath or smaller group of people that are built up, because that's what the gifts are given to us for. He's given us all the gifts so that we might be built up and build each other up. And so this idea of, you know, tongues, you might feel really great and powerful when you're praying for somebody and you put your hand on their forehead and then you begin to speak in tongues and pray over them. But in that moment, if they don't know what's happening, they are no longer trying to connect with God meaningfully. They're trying to figure out what you're doing. And so it's possible you may need to take a step back and have a little bit more social awareness and think about if I'm in public and people that I'm praying for, with, around don't have a good understanding, then it might be more advantageous for me to ask God to begin to use me in the gift of prophecy. Now, again, I'm not downing or downplaying the gift of tongues. I'm just saying that when someone speaks a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, when someone comes to you and says, hey, I really have something I wanna share with you and God, I feel like God wants you to know this. When someone speaks to the whole church and says, hey, this is something I feel like God wants all of us to be thinking about, praying about right now, um, then, then multiple people are built up and developed. But when you begin to ramble off in an unknown language that's known only to you and God, then the only person who's being built up is you. And so, and operate in the gift of tongues. Listen to me right now. This is very important. You need to have a social awareness of your prayer language when you are in public. Why? Because the Bible says so. That's the foundation for those of us who get really excited about speaking in tongues out loud. And that there's a time and a place, there's an appropriateness and then there's an inappropriateness of what that looks like and the when and the how of what that looks like. So what do we know about tongues? Well, in the same vein, if you keep reading verses 18 and 19 from chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul continues, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct another than 10,000 words in tongues. And while it is normal, while we see it historically in the Bible, that the filling or overflowing or fueling or baptism of the Holy Spirit is often accompanied by speaking in tongues, that the speaking in tongues help other people find the gift. And so what he's saying is, I'd rather you help other people find the giver of the gift than you just show off your gift. Let me say that one more time for you in case you weren't listening, everybody way in the back. What Paul is saying to his church and what I'm saying to my church, what we're all saying to God's church, are you with me? I would rather you show people the generosity of the giver of the gifts 
the kindness, the compassion, the love that comes to other people. That gift is for you, so use it wisely. Use it appropriately. So I promised you I'd answer the question, do you have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit? And the answer is no. Now, I know some of my super Pentecostal friends are going to get really mad at me right now, and you're going to jump into the comments, and you're going to give me emails, and you're going to text me right now. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. You do not have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit, because you are filled with the Spirit at your conversion. Trick question, I know. But how about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Pastor Eric? Do I have to be filled with, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it always accompanied by tongues? And the answer to that question is, ish. The normative expression that accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit is often tongues. That the initial outward or physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is often tongues. But God chooses to do what he chooses to do, how he chooses to do it. And so I don't want to let my theology be so boxed in that I don't leave room for God. So the answer, I guess, in both cases is filled with the Spirit and baptized with the Holy Spirit is no. Is it mostly the normative in Scripture and biblical history and church history to speak in tongues when someone receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Yes. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says it like this. So I say to live by the Spirit so that you would not gratify the desires of the sinful nature for your sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to your sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want to do. And so Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, He's saying that there's a war going on inside of you and that being filled with the Spirit or these subsequent, as I like to call them, refillings, are you yielding daily, hourly, moment by moment to the power limit before you go into a scenario or a situation? For some of you, that might be, I'm at the hospital and I'm gonna go pray for somebody who's sick and ailing. And so I, I pray, God, would you just fill me once again with your power and your presence? I'm lacking faith right now. Would you give me the gift of faith? Lord, I would love to pray for this person and see them healed, but I've never been used in the gift of healing. God, if it's your will, would you use me in the gift of healing right now? Lord, let me speak a word to this family that would help them. Let me prophesy. Let, let me give them something to cling to in this season of their life that isn't going the way that they want to. It might might be as you are stepping into your family after a long day of work or going to visit the in-laws or going back to work in the chaos of what life looks like or the fear that you might have as you get ready to send your kids back to school as schools decide whether they're going to open up or not. It might be that you ask God to give you the spirit, his presence, a little extra in this moment. It might be that God is challenging you to give financially. And so he's using you in the gift of generosity. And you're like, God, I, I need you to fill me once again. I used to be super generous with my time, talent, treasure, testimony, but I've become more and more selfish in this season of chaos. Lord, would you just fill me again with your power and your presence so that I can? Would you let me experience the baptism of your Holy Spirit fresh and new so that I can begin to operate in that gifting again? I've forgotten where it was. Can you show me again? In other words, walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, a life fueled by the Spirit is about understanding your influence. How you influence the world and what influences you. In Ephesians, Paul writes, chapter 5, verse 15 through 18. I like it from the NLT again. He says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. And then he goes further. He says, don't be drunk on wine because it will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what he's asking the ancient church in this moment is the spirit, alcohol, or you could be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. One has the potential to ruin your life. The other has the potential to make your life amazing, profitable, and successful. 
So the bottom line to all of it is simply this. I mean, I stated it four, years ago, or four weeks ago. I don't know how I could say it any better than I, could, than I said it then, and I'll say it again. A life led by the Spirit is a life that's keeping in step with what God is up to. And we get so caught up in the gifts of the Spirit that we lose sight of the giver. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Not just in our Sundays, not just in our life groups, not just in our prayer meetings, not just in our devotional time, but in every aspect, in every avenue, in every corner, in every nook and cranny, in every closet of our hearts, let's allow the Holy Spirit to take up residence and let him have his way. He'll help us to be socially aware. He'll help us to be um, you know, thoughtful about how we operate in our gifts. He'll lead us, he'll prompt us. If we spend time with him, we'll know his voice and his voice will lead us. But the bottom line to all of it is, it's not about the gifts, but the giver of those gifts. The gifts are secondary to live a life. Love, understanding of the giver. To live a life led by the Spirit. Let me read it to you one more time as we close. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let's do it. This week, this moment, this day, let's make that our commitment that in every part of our lives, we will yield to the Holy Spirit and let him work in us, through us, to bring hope to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.